best spot there or there? Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks uh, that you <clears throat> gathered us together. And we ask that you might bless us tonight. And so we want to learn more and more about the love you have for us in Jesus Christ. In his name. Amen. Emma, can you come up? Emma is uh, coordinating a project at St. Andrew. And I would invite her to invite you to join her in that project. So you've got a sheet in front of you. Take a look at that sheet. What do you want to tell us about it, Emma? Okay, well, we're having a sale called Computer Chickens. I didn't know. I didn't know chickens like cookies. They don't. They don't? Oh, okay. Then why are you making cookies for chickens? It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are having a bake sale to raise five chickens for Guatemala, little country. Who knows where Guatemala is? Where is it? No? Are your geography <coughs> teachers? South America? No. No. Mexico. No. It is near Mexico. So Central America. You know that land between. So Guatemala is in Central. What language do they speak in Guatemala? Abas Espanol. No. Do you speak Spanish? Espanol. They speak Spanish in Guatemala. Why do they need chickens there? Um, like, well, so they can lay eggs and maybe money and stuff. Yeah. It's a, it's a very, very poor country. People struggle to make enough money to afford for kids to go to school. And so, you know, having a profitable business, some people make, is the key to getting an education and all sorts of things. And you want to help me? Yes. What do you need these guys to do? Well, um, you guys can make stuff for retail, and you can um, bring it to the church at Saturday. And then any time tonight, or early before, yeah, early Sunday. And then also you guys can um, help us work the stand on Sunday and it's going to be between all services. So. It would be a great way. And, it, and it's really, you know, uh, anybody been to a very, very poor country? Uh, I was in Kenya. Kenya is very, very poor. Guatemala is very, very poor. And... Uh, uh, a si people live very simply, they live very modestly, they live saving a lot, not having a lot, and you could make a difference. Because buying some chickens would allow them to produce a business, which then allows them to make money, go to school, all sorts of, of differences. <coughs> and you can help. Who could make cookies and help some way? Cookies, cupcakes, anything you make specially, if you want to buy it, do a cake or anything. We call it cookies, but anything you want to cook. Do they need to wrap them individually? I don't have baggies, but if they go ahead and pre-wrap, that's great too. And last time when we did cupcakes, some people bought the whole pan, and some people just bought one. So it'd be nice if we had like a whole plate of cookies, like a dozen, or then just some individual cookies. Okay. Who would like to help on Sunday morning? So what do they need to do? Just show up? Or do you want to sign them up? <clears throat> and uh, sign them times? It doesn't matter. We can do it either way. So. Why don't you just look for the display, come by, It'll be in the middle of the and help out? The best thing you can do is smile and ask people. 
You know, asking people can be a great, great help. All right, that's good. Anything else you need to tell us? Just smile and have fun. So you can bake them, bring them Saturday, bring them early Sunday, look for the display, help out. Well done, Emma. filling out uh, the sheets about me, I discovered that two of you had my th two of my favorite TV shows on there. Who thinks they had their my favorite TV show on your list? Uh, that was the, that one my favorite. Man vs. Wild. Man Wild. Um, I really like Survivor Man better, but Man vs. Wild with Bear Grylls. Anybody watch Man vs. Wild? They're going, what is that? I've never heard of that. And there was one other one that, that had on it, and it was Aaron, and I like watching Pawn Stars. Oh, I love that show. <laughs> and you learn all sorts of interesting things about all sorts of old stuff that uh, people are selling. So. And I discovered there are lots of TV shows I've never heard of. <laughs> what were those? Ridiculousness? Something Rush? Dance Moms? Okay, I, I discovered that I must, live, I must live in a cave somewhere. Uh, I need your help. Can you take out a scrap piece of paper that you're going to turn in? You don't need to put your name on it. Doesn't have to be a fancy. You can take a piece of paper and share it with the person next to you. They could have half and uh, But if you don't have a piece of paper, get one from somebody. Here's what I'd like you to do right now. It was 168 hours ago that we were together in this room. And uh, right now for me, Three things you remember about what we did last week, and particularly be thinking of what things did you learn that were new, or maybe they were things you already knew, but was you were reminded of them. Three things from last week. Just what do you remember? What stood out in your mind? Do that real quickly. You don't have to put your name on it. I'm going to collect them. So as soon as you get it. Now, you know this is a test, don't you? But who am I testing? My brain. No. I'm testing me. I think I know what I meant to teach. I had it clear in my mind. Now I'm going to see how well a job that I did. What did you come away learning? I think I know what I was trying to teach, but so this is really not a test of you, it's a test of me. You know, tests are often that way, they really test the teacher in terms of how effective have I been or teachers been in motivating you to learn the things you need to know and convincing you that it's worth your time and energy and effort to learn those things. So you got your three things down? Who's going? <laughs> Three things you remember. And they don't have to be long things. You can just put it in brief notes. Or they could be long things. Who's got all three of theirs now? Andrew, would you mind collecting as others? Since you got your three down, start collecting those, hounding people and saying, come on. You know? Quickly as you can, what do you remember? What things did you learn? Thank mm -hmm. you.
normal. I'm just going to kind of review. Let's just do some quick review. I learned more about Adam and Eve. How many of you put something about the story that we talked about? Adam and Eve. Uh, some, did you go to in detail like how uh, Adam and Eve blamed God? You know, they didn't just blame each other, but they blamed God. Somebody wrote it and was talking about that thing, and they said, don't blame God. You did it. Who needs to take responsibility? Who remember saying, who's responsible for your sin? Mine. i got to take ownership of that. Not to hide from our sins that we repent. Remember, you know, when your mom comes and looks you in the eye and says, did you do it? What do you need to do? Be straightforward and honest. In the same way with God. <coughs> Somebody wrote down, Satan will strike our heel, but crush the head. That as Satan attacks us, but who delivers the fatal blow to Satan? Crushes his head. Jesus does. Talked about forgiveness. You know, one of the hand we talk about the problem is free little sin. Now I'm going to ask a question. We're going to get to this later. Listen carefully to the way I ask this question. If the problem is sin, Emma, who is the solution? God. And what would you call his first name? Jesus. If the problem is sin, who's the solution for us? Jesus. Thank you for listening carefully to the way I asked the question. That God's favorite sport is baseball. They <laughs> remembered my really dumb joke. Uh, how many of you put something about, we did some review in our small group. There are several people that talked about, or we got to know people in our group. You know, that's part of the learning process. It doesn't just take place by ourselves. We, we best learn in community, together. Adam and Eve, fall of sin. How we're just like Adam and Eve. How many of you put something like that saying? You know, and several of you I was looking saying, the Bible isn't a story just about people wanting to go. It's a story about me. Oh, I like somebody put part of why we're here for our class is to confirm our faith. I like that language. Confirmation isn't something that happens to you, it's something you do. The, the gift of faith that's yours, that God gives to you, uh, you will have the opportunity at the end of our instruction in a couple, couple years to confirm your faith and say, you know, this faith, that uh, this love that God has for me in Jesus, I want to pledge my life. I want to confirm that faith. I want to say, you know, it's mine, and I plan to, to live for him. Group time. Somebody put, I got to study Bibles. You know what? I'm going to be in my small group this evening, and Dr. Sparkman says it so well. He says, he calls these smart Bibles. One of the things we're going to start looking at is there's all sorts of helps in these smart Bibles. All sorts of things that you can find your way through. Uh, it's got it's got a subject index, so that it's a smart Bible that helps you find your way. Uh, someone putting, God loves us. You know, we want to echo that theme every time we meet. How many of you recognize that uh, you've made some serious errors since the last time we met, in some way, shape, or form? And those errors we would call, you know what, 
was freed off that sin. But what we want to know and we remind each other is that God's taking care of us, that we live in forgiveness. God is forgiven. The Bible is not just a story about us, that Adam and Eve, it's a story about us. Ooh, someone wrote the temptation is that uh, we'll become like God. You remember that? Remember the story when we read it? Oh, that, you know, if you do this, you'll be like God. Who likes to boss other people around? Be honest. It's funny. If, if you're a big sister, do you ever boss little brother around? You try to, right? You don't have any. You, you've got one little sister. Do you ever like to boss Claire around? Kalani, you don't have anybody to boss around. It's disappointing, isn't it? I would bet that at times, all the children like to boss mom and dad around. Have you ever, have you ever said something like this to your mom and dad? If you really loved me, you would let me do this. How many at some point have wanted to accuse your parents of not loving you? You know, really good parents would let me do this. You know, if you really were good and that you would put all these restrictions on it. Who are you trying to boss around? Moms and dads, right? That, that happens. Adam and Eve. They, you know, the story of Adam and Eve, there, there were really three things they did in that story. They sinned, right? And then what's the next thing they tried to do? They tried to hide from that sin. They tried to cover it up, pretend like it didn't happen. And then when they couldn't pretend like it didn't happen, what was their next strategy? Blame somebody else, right? That's what we've all done. You listen very carefully, thank you. I, I'm very impressed with the things that you put down. The key to learning is who needs to work hard. Yeah. And who also ought to work hard to make it easier for you. The teacher. It's a partnership. Partnership. Uh, but you are truly in control of that. You ready to learn some new things tonight? Let me see if I got some notes that tell me what I want to teach you. Oh, there it is. Who got their contract signed? Who go? Who forgot completely to have their contract signed? Your dad's sitting right next to you, so you can get him to sign it. Uh, if you are, if you have all signatures on your contract, yours, your parents, and the only one that you're missing is mine, raise your hand. And I will come and sign that contract. Turn it around. Just turn your notebook around. I will. Who's ready for this? She's in class. She'll when yes. I'm glad I got a short name. Some of you have some interesting nicknames that I did not realize that you liked.
that your pen? I always steal pen. Thank you. Uh, summarize the contract. What do I need to do? Work hard. My best for you. What do you need to do? Your best for God. Absolutely. Absolutely. I gave you a prayer journal last week. How many of you remember getting these? And I forgot to tell you anything about it. Anybody use it this week? How many of you have some really good habits that you do? Anybody play an instrument and you practice it faithfully every day? Who has an instrument and wishes they practice it faithfully every day? What are some good habits that you have? Tell me who's got a good habit that they're proud of that you want to share with class. How many of you have the habit of brushing your teeth every day? How many of you have the brushing your teeth most every day? <laughs> you know. You know, good habits. But research demonstrates that you've got to do something about every day for about a month before it becomes simply easy for you to do. And it only takes you missing about three or four days and you can lose that great habit. You know? But once you do something routinely every day without missing for a month, it becomes very easy, natural to do and uh, you don't have to think about it. In fact, it becomes simply part of your routine, part of your day. I'd like to encourage you to develop a great habit that could last a lifetime and serve you well. And that's to do a little bit of reading from the Bible and then writing some reflections on it. It's called journaling. Anybody? There's somebody in this class that said their dream is to be a writer. How do you get good at writing? You do. Who here is an outstanding free throw shooter? How do you learn to shoot free throws? How do you learn to shoot free throws? Over and over. You know, somebody may give you some great technique. I had a really good coach who taught me everything on free throws lines up on one side of the body. If you can get everything going in a straight line, you got a better chance. But then, what do I need to do to get good at it? Just do it over and over and over until it becomes so easy and natural you don't have to think about it. Here's a habit that I would love to encourage you to adopt because it could serve you well. Here's what we'd like you to do. We want you to read the Gospel of John. Not the Gospel of Mark. Why the Gospel of Mark? It's the shortest gospel. It's written in simple language. It's easy. You can break it down and read just a few verses at a time. And you can get it read pretty quickly. And so this is a 40-day journal. And... Uh, Occasionally it has a full chapter, sometimes just a few verses. It takes probably on the average two to six minutes to read what's there. And then just to write about, uh, write something after you do some reading. Maybe there's something in the reading that made you think. Maybe there's something in your life that you've been thinking about and just to jot some things down. Uh, we're not going to read these. These are for you. But uh, what a great, great habit to read the Bible and just to think thoughtfully. You could probably get this done in five to ten minutes or less. But what does it take? It takes doing it every single day. What is it going to take for you? Who would like to develop that habit of just those few those few quiet moments. You know, some of the 
some of the best thinkers, the people I admire the most, are people who take a few minutes to write down. You know, the other thing that's fun to do is you put it away and then you come back and read it. And you read about what your thoughts. The only time I have successfully journaled for any length of time is when I went to Kenya. I have the first 11 days, I've got notes, and they're not long notes. They're just a few sentences, sometimes just a word or two. And I can go back and look at that journal, and it can take me back to that day, and I can recall what it was and, and what I wanted to remember about that experience. The last five days, I didn't journal. I can tell you, I can't tell you a thing about what happened those five days. But just a few little words, and it can remind me of the experience. It took me probably, I think it's been more than three or four minutes. We had long days. We were tired. But just taking a few minutes to write a few things about what I was thinking about, what I was moved by, what I saw, uh, what I heard. And I can go back, and the first 11 days, I can recall like that. You know, those few words, and I can recall all sorts of things. But the last five days, I remember there's nothing in my journal to help me remind me of it. So it can be a great, great discipline that's going to benefit you. That's my best pitch. How are you going to remember to, to do this? Who, can, who has great intentions and can forget very easily, besides me? What do you need to do to get over that and start doing it daily? Any strategies? Anybody got an idea of what you're going to do to help make this. Have somebody remind you. Doesn't hurt. And it won't be your mom, because she'll forget too. Uh, on my phone, like reminder. Ooh, how many of you have a smartphone with a reminder? That could be a great way. And I have not heard that strategy. What a wonderful strategy. In fact, you can have it give you the reminder at what's typically going to be the best time. You know, figuring out what's the best time to do that. For me, if I'm going to get it done, I need to do it first thing in the morning or last thing in the evening. And for me, first thing is probably better. Because when I sit quietly at the end of the day, what do I do? <laughs> I fall asleep very quickly at the end of the day. Some reminders, either somebody reminded you. Uh, some people put a post-it note on their mirror where they're going to, you know, if the best time for you to do this is right after you brush your teeth, put a reminder where you brush your teeth. Whatever it is. Do uh, you know what one young person did as a great strategy? Is they put it on their pillow. That for them, a few minutes right before their bed, they went to sleep, was a great time, and just the time for them to kind of think. So they put it there where it would be, oh, I'll just take a couple minutes and do this. And what better excuse to stay up a couple minutes later? <laughs> Mom, I've got to read my Bible. So I have a bunk bed, and wherever we on the bottom of the top. Of yeah. If you sleep on the bottom of a bunk, you go, oh, there it is. A reminder. All sorts of different strategies. Here's what it takes. It first takes your commitment to do it. To say, this is important enough for me to spend a few minutes. And then it takes a matter of doing it every day. Do you think you'd be better at it the 30th day than the first day? You might discover the first day, I don't have a clue what you're but you kind of force yourself and you make yourself. By the time you're doing it the 30th time or the 60th time, you got to figure it out. It's so much easier. In that way, how many of you are uh, in, in, in a dance class of some sort? Anybody dancer? Anybody here in a sport? Isn't it easier doing it the 100th time than it was the first time? You've got a complicated... Uh, technique that you got to learn. How many of you are swimmers? You know, 
developing your technique just takes time. And those first times you try it, it can feel awkward, unnatural, and you just gotta keep doing it. And then all of a sudden you don't have to think about it. You do it very naturally. You do it very easily. Could you do this? Would you give it, would you give it a great shot? It would reap benefits in your life. What I need you to do is take some notes. Could you do that? Why do I want you to take some notes? Anybody got an idea of what I'm going to ask? Sarah, why do you think I want you to take some notes? Can I have a clue? Yeah. I'm going to tell you why I want you to take some notes is if you only listen, if you close your eyes and listen, you're only using one of your senses. So you need to, I'm going to write some stuff down so that I engage more than one sense. Uh, you know, engages, it makes learning easier. So the purpose of writing may be so you have something to recall, but it's simply another way of trying to stay focused. So uh, what I want you to do is to draw a grid that looks something like this on your paper. Let me see if I can. you to work write the word problem. Now in mathematics when you're given a problem, what do you start looking for? You look for a, a solution, right? You got a problem, you got to look for a solution. McKenzie, as we're here in confirmation class, and we talked about last week, what's my problem and your problem and everybody's problem, including Adam and Eve? Sin. Sin. Yeah. It's a simple word. The problem that we're going to be talking about is the problem of sin. Now, Emma has already given us a clue as to the solution. Amy, do you remember what Emma said when I asked her the question, who is the solution to sin? Jesus. Jesus is the solution to sin. The problem is sin. <clears throat> now, I've got a who would like to be in the hot seat? Who's really up to a hard, hard question? I'd like to join me up here. Oh, Sam, come in here. Sit in the hot seat. Who's, who's not surprised that Sam volunteered for the hot seat? Okay. All right, does it bring warm there? Yep. All right, all right. Now, I got a tough question for you to ask. Really tough. But I think, what do you call, this is really tough. You'll get the second, after you get the first half, you get the second half. Uh, you know, what do you call something that helps you recognize that you've got a problem called sin? You know, that's in the Bible. You'll find it in the Bible. And, and, uh, but you'll find not just the problem in the Bible, you'll find what else in the Bible? The solution, right? Now, part of the Bible that helps you recognize that you've got a problem you know? I think it's the commandment. Okay. Now, what's a simpler, shorter word for the commandments? If you sum them up. Rules. Rules. Maybe even shorter. Three letters. Um, you need a phone a phone a friend? Sure. Justice. Wow. Do you do you think that's right? What do you think? Oh, you weren't even paying attention. Is that a final answer? Yeah. 
All right. You know, law helps us recognize. Give me an example of a law. Give me one example of one one law. Um, you shall have no other gods. You shall have no other gods. So who's ever been guilty of putting something more important than God? The law. The law helps us recognize. Give me another example of the law. Uh, I looked at some laws as you and I were driving here this, this afternoon. What laws did I see? Speed limit. That's a law, isn't it? There's a sign that says speed limit. And if you go under it, you're okay. And if you go over it, you, you're breaking the law. You're a, you're a sinner. You're doing, can you, well, we'll get to that in a little later. But it's the law. I look at it, you know, you look at the speed limit, it says 45. And you look down and going, I'm seven. You know what? <laughs> I do not drive fast. I'm a, I, grand, I am a grandpa and I can drive like a grandpa. <laughs> but if I were going over the speed limit, what conclusion would I be? Am I breaking the law? There were some other laws that were out there. Some of them are called stop signs. And Top ones, all sorts of laws posted. The law helps us recognize that we got a problem. Now, here's here's the other half. Are there laws in the Bible? And you know what? Whenever you read those laws in the Bible, one of the conclusions you come to is what? That I'm a sinner. That I didn't do it. Even when I was trying my best, I didn't quite measure up to the way that God wanted it done. Now, if the law is the portion of the Bible that helps us recognize that we've got a problem called sin, what is it that we call the portion of the Bible that, and don't blurt out an answer, who thinks they know the answer at all? Justin thinks he knows the answer. Should I have brought him to the hot seat today? Maybe, yeah. No, I bet you. This is a harder one, but it begins with a letter. What letter do you think it begins with? Well, it depends. Either a T or an N. A what? A T or an N. Don't, don't do them as a phone friend. <laughs> <laughs> what portion of the law, the Bible, helps you recognize that God's got a solution to the problem of sin? We often link them together. Mackenzie and Gracie think they know. Do you think you know? Okay. What do you think it is? Uh, not Genesis. What do you think it is? The law and the gospel. Gospel is from the root is from a germ two German words. Two German words. Anybody know German? It simply means good news. What do you think the good news is? The gospel. What is the gospel good news? That Jesus is the solution to the problem of sin. Do you think you hear good news when you read and look at the Bible? Absolutely. It'd be the good news that we got a solution. What do you call people? The, the next one's easy and then the next one's fine. What do you call, who do you want to call on for this one? Kalani's volunteer. Oh, there's several people. You need to sign quickly. Mackenzie. Mackenzie, what do you call people who have the problem of sin? Sinners. Sinners. 
She did the easy hat for you afterwards. <laughs> what do you call people for whom the problem of sin has been solved? Then it begins with the letter S. Alexis thinks she knows. Alexis thinks she knows. What's the next letter? A. And the next one is I. I. In. In. Got sinners and they sinners. Saints simply a, a way of talking about people who live in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Forgive them. People who are sinners who have not been forgiven. And that would be an eternal death that includes a life in hell. But people who are on the path of living in forgiveness have not death, but life. And they have eternal life. And life kind of to heaven. Now what's what we're going to do as we read the Bible. Now, the story of Adam and Eve that we read last week, was it a story of law or gospel, primarily? Law. Why? What did it make us do? Right. And what conclusion did you make about yourself? That I'm just like them. It was a law story, wasn't it? Now, it has a little hint of gospel at the end of it, where, uh, but it's not a real clear expression of gospel. But there's a little bit in there as we read that, you know, that uh, uh, Satan's going to keep nipping at your heels, but the one who comes after will crush his head. That there's going to be a victory, a solution. But it doesn't name for us that solution yet. But can you see how it is? Give Sam a great hand. Thank him for coming. You know what, the, the, the thing about Sam volunteering to be up here, one, it left him behind over here. But what it does is, did you know every answer that I was up there? No. But that's the gateway to learning, isn't it? Is to challenge yourself to learn new things. Part of it, if you caught my style, is to call on it. Do I expect you to know everything? If you did, would you need to be here? We're here to be learned. Right? <clears throat> and sometimes the best way to learn is, how many of you have said, said, you know, there's some, the best way to learn was to start all the time, so you have to really work at it. And it's, it's when it comes easy that it's so easy to forget. It's when we struggle, and you know, I have to think through it. That's often the best way to learn. How many of you are spectacularly good at memorizing things quickly? And then spectacularly good at forgetting them almost as quickly as you learn? How, who here, when you have to memorize something, struggles? You have to work at it and work at it and work at it. But you've got most of it, for, once you learn it, you've got most of it to stay. Now, which is more... Now, in school, what you typically get graded on is being a fast learner, right? But in the long run, which is better? To learn things very quickly and to get an A on it when you say it in class, but two weeks later to be able to remember 10% of it, or to struggle with it when you did it in class, you got a C, you only do 75% of it, but two weeks later, you do the 75% still. Who really learned? It's the one who struggled. The one who regained it. And, and so, some of you are going to be blessed to learn things very quickly. The challenge when you learn very quickly is it can disappear just as fast. So, uh, often the better path of learning is we're going to struggle with it. You really have to grapple with it.
finish in time with it. And then you go, I got it. And then you have it for the long haul. Like what a great, great blessing to you. And a challenge if you learn things quickly. Because what I'd like you to do is not learn this quickly, but learn this step. Right here so you can follow. Who thinks they could write that from memory without? Test your stuff real quickly. Turn that paper over. See if you can get everything on that chart. There was a grid, and it has 10 words on it. See if you can get them in order. Test yourself real quickly. Who got all 10 items without having looked through the paper? Who got at least eight of them? Who's going, um, I got the grid down. <laughs> Oops. I've got to bring my eraser with me. <coughs> Who needs to struggle a bit with this and learn it better? Who's willing to come up and help teach the rest of us? Who would like to come up but you're embarrassed to raise your hand? <laughs> Should we send your mom up? <laughs> hey, come on up. What are we going to put up in this upper room? You can't bring your paper with you. You got to do it for Henry up here. You can do it. What, what goes over here? Problem. How many got that part down? The problem. And when you got a problem, what are you looking for? A solution. A solution. How many got that? You got the grid, got the problem, got the... Now, in as we come to church and as we read the Bible, what do we discover the problem is? Sin. Sin. Bat a hundred, bat a thousand. Three for three. How many got that far? Now, and the solution to sin is Jesus. She already made the Hall of Fame. She's, you know, there are only ten. She got four out of the, four out of the. What is it in the Bible that helps us recognize that we got the problem called sin? Oh. Law. She got, she got half of them. How many got them all so far? Now, what is it the message of the Bible that helps us recognize that we've got a solution to the problem of sin in Jesus Christ? Gospel. I'm going to ask you to write with a big G the gospel. Simply meaning good news. The good news. The good news that you and I have a Savior who paid the price on the cross for you and me. What do we put here? Sinner. Sinner. The people who recognize they have a problem, we call them sinners. And the people for whom the problem is solved are saints. saints. Now I'm going to put you, what do you think you ought to put right after in parentheses? And that was what you wanted to say. I think. That started with the letter F. Um, faith. A faith. If the sins have been taken care of, they are forgiven. forgiven. What saints are simply forgiven sinners. People who recognize they've got a problem but it's been taken care of. They live in forgiveness. And what's the path that if the problem's never solved, it's a path that leads to death.
Life now and life for eternity. Now, here's how this little chart can be helpful to you. When you read the Bible, at times you're reading for information, right? Some details. What would be an example? Find something in the Bible that would just give you some information. Find the, open your Bible. Find the story. Give her a great hand. She do excellent Thank you. How many of you got, how many of you could do that from memory now? You can all tell. Absolutely. Absolutely. You find something that just gives you information. Anybody find anything? What you find? Okay, it gives you information, tells you some details about somebody, right? So there's part of the Bible would be just giving you the information and the details. Give me an example of a story that acts at like law and helps you recognize the problem. Sam already says one of them up here. What was it? What's that longer word that you used for law? Commandments. Ten commandments. You think those are law? You look at it and what do you come? I've not done everything God asked me to do. What's another story, Emma, that you want to tell us that helps you recognize the problem? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Is that one that helps us recognize the problem? Or is it a story that tells about God's solution to the problem? Um, solution. solution. You picked a great, great example of a passage that largely tells us the good news of what God has done. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, maybe you said, I had to, I learned it when I was a boy in what we call the Revised Standard Version, the RSV, and then we used NIV, and now we're using ESV uh, as we try to get a Bible that more and more accurately reflects the original intent. What were the languages that Scripture were originally recorded in? Old Testament was written in what language? Not Greek, Old Testament? Hebrew. Hebrew. And that is a really interesting language because it writes from right to left. And so, and the letters don't look at all like what we write with. Um, so it, it's a very, very... Now, if I gave you a Bible in the original language and you saw letters that looked like that, what would you say? I can't read. I can't read. What do you need? A new translation. So what we have is a translation. Now, and so the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew. And it sounded something like this. The first, uh, uh, the Genesis. Bereshit bara Elohim ve'ez ha'aretz. Bereshit bara Elohim. It's a different sounding language. They speak it very gutturally uh, and, and write it differently. Uh, the New Testament is written in what language? Greek. Greek. And you and I need what? Should I put the Greek in front of you and we say in arcane and halagas? Kai halagas and trastan de Does that help you? No. Why not? Don't you understand Greek? No. It's the language of the Bible. What do you need? You need a translation. Right. You need a translation. 
And does language stay the same? How many of you have tried to read Shakespeare and struggled to understand it? They speak language. English was spoken differently than it was. Now, if you can't tell, I love language. You know, and I talk about, you know, I'm, I'm so jealous of you because you have young brains and everything so quickly. I do memory work every year. And I'm not nearly as good as, it, as I once was. I have to work 10 times harder and I remember about a 10. So I have to work to, to learn what I, to learn what I could learn when I was your age, I have to work 100 times harder now than I did. You know, the young brain simply are wired. God designed you to learn. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, but languages change. I read in some middle English. Would you like to hear some English that's older than Shakespeare? Let me see. One that are bloody with the shorty sort of brota of mark and person to the rota and bonded every vein in swish liqueur, of which we have to enjoy the, is the fluid. That's English. Anybody understand that? What do you think you heard? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> One that abrile. When that April, when that abrile with the shorty sort, the shower is sweet. You know, it, it, uh, but. English has changed. Now that takes English back to the, when it was close to German and French, and it was a kind of amalgamation of those two languages. And some of it sounded like it was German, and some of it sounded like it was French, and English brought those two languages together. But that English of about 800 years ago doesn't sound like anything like English does today. Do you think a translation of the English Bible needs to change so that you can understand it in your language of this day? So that's why we keep updating and changing and those kinds of things, translations. Uh, now, where did we get, how did we get to that point? Where were we at? What were we talking about? We're talking about looking at the Bible. And uh, it's John 3.16, which is a story of largely law gospel. 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 Give me another gospel story from the scripture. The resurrection? What? Like the resurrection. The resurrection. The story, he is not here. He is risen. You know, the stories, any of them that tell us the good news of God's solution would be gospel. And any of them that would help us recognize the problem would be sin. Here's what I want to challenge you to do when you read the Bible. Uh, and I used to make it a, a requirement, so few kids did it. What I really wish you'd do is to make a bookmark, a little skinny bookmark with that outline on it, and put it in your Bibles and laminate it. And then when you start reading something, you can say, now is this helping me recognize the problem? Or is it helping me understand God's solution? Or is it just information telling me about the, the, the details of the story? Uh, but particularly to look about, what does it tell me about myself? Does it help me recognize my problem? Or does it help me recognize the good news of Jesus Christ? Law and gospel. You got all that down? Who could do it from memory? Excellent. What I'd like you to do is hang on to it. Now, when we talk about the law, we really talk about it. Now, they told me I could use this as poster notes. Let me figure if I can figure this out. Oh, there. Here is. God's law is life. What am I trying to put a picture up there? What's a, what do you think it might look like? Amber? A 
picture frame, and I put this here so it try to look like a, a mirror, to try to convey the idea. When you look at a mirror, what do you see? You see yourself, right? You pull out a mirror, you look at it, you go, wow, my nose is too big. You know, you look at yourself. You see things about yourself. How is God's law like a mirror? Gracie, you have an idea? How is God's law like a mirror? It reflects. Yeah, it reflects. You look at it and you see yourself. What conclusion, if I looked at God's law, and what am I going to come to? What conclusion about myself? What do I see? God says, don't do this. I look at me and I go, uh-oh. Like you see yourself as imperfect and as a sinner. It shows me SOS. It shows our sin. One of the purposes that God gave and he put the law into our hearts and wrote it is to help us recognize there are really three purposes to God's law. One of them is to be a mirror. It shows our sin. And that's the way we talked about it in that outline, isn't it? That little grid that we make. Now, God's law isn't just a mirror. God's, let me see if I can make this work. It's a mirror, and I look at myself, and I come to the conclusion that I'm a sinner. That's supposed to look like fence. When I was a boy, my dad's family farm loved to go there as a boy. Now, the farmhouse was up on the road at the top of the hill. And what do you think? There was a long hill. What was at the bottom of that hill at the other end of the pasture? A fence. There was a fence, but before you got to that fence, what do you think was down there? Love to spend time down there. Pond. There's a pond. And when I went to the farm, what did I want to do? I want to go fishing. Now, my uncle raised cattle. He lived on the family farm. And he had the biggest black-handed bull you ever would have seen. Now, what I would do is I would have to calculate how badly do I want to go fishing? And I might wait was as far at the other end of the pasture as you get. And then I would start walking very softly, and gingerly. And it didn't make any difference how quiet or how soft that bull would raise its head. How many of you have had a bull running at you? It is scary as you. I mean, they're huge animals. And I mean, it bore its head, and it, the slobber and snot would be hanging off that bull, and it'd be pawing the ground. And what was it that? Kept me safe. The red fence. <laughs> a little fence. Now the fence my uncle had didn't look nearly like that. It was a single strand of electrified fence. I mean, you know, I just had little poles hanging up, and uh, I'm looking at that going. That really can't be enough. I mean, that bull could run through that fence in a second. But I set a prayer of thanks for that fence because without that fence there, what would have happened to you? Elijah. <laughs> Amen. God's law is like that, though, isn't it? Does it protect?
respect you? Can you imagine going to the playground at school? Who's the law on the playground? <laughs> well, theoretically, it's the teacher who's going to protect you from those eighth graders. But can you imagine what the playground would be like if there was no wall? What would happen? The biggest, meanest kid would rule, wouldn't it? Anybody, you know anybody who might, that you might be a little frightened of because if there weren't somebody around, they'd be not sure what they'd do. Right? God's law is like the fence that protects you. Can you imagine what it would be like if there were no traffic laws in Cape Girardeau? Can you imagine if there were no speed limits on King's Highway? Can you imagine what it would be like to get home tonight? There might be people going 100 miles an hour. Where there is no law, it's very, very dangerous. When the law breaks down, Where are places today where law has broken down and they get very, very dangerous? It appears to be serious one of those countries right now. I can tell you firsthand, uh, many years ago, Lebanon was one of those countries. And I had a dear, close missionary friend who lived in Beirut. And uh, when he came back, you know, there what had happened is the government fell apart. So there weren't any armies to impose law. Uh, civil authority fell apart. And so what would happen is neighborhoods would simply arm themselves and have their own private militia. So there would be young men, 14, 15, 16, with machine guns. Now, you were relatively safe when you were in your area of protection, but where was it dangerous? When you went outside your area to a place they didn't know, and you, are there parts of St. Louis that you think might be dangerous for you to drive through? Yeah, big cities? Does that mean it's dangerous to go to St. Louis? No, it just means you stay away from those areas where law has broken down. But can you imagine what happens when there's no law? You get on the playground, there's no rules. There's no teacher to ensure your safety. The biggest, meanest kid does whatever the biggest, meanest kid wants to do. God's law is like a fence, or sometimes we do it a club, to protect us law protects. That's one of the functions of law. But can you imagine what it would be like? How many of you have watched old westerns where, you know, where, where the, there, you get to a lawless town, what happens? Whoever has the most weapons rules. But God's law protects and keeps us safe. You want to live where there isn't any law? No. 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 Too dangerous. Can you imagine what it would be like on the soccer field if there were no red cards? It's bad enough with the threat of a red, yellow and red cards, right? Can you imagine? What's it like when you get on the playground and you play basketball and uh, there are no referees? Is it really basketball? No, it's just kind of a free-for-all, isn't it? 
Uh, and if you're bigger and stronger, I just say, oh, I don't see any blood. That's no foul. <laughs> you know? Uh, all sorts of things. So one of the purposes of God's law, you know, one of them is it's a mirror that helps us recognize the problem of sin. Another purpose of God's law, it is a it's protection. God gave the law so that you could be saved. Should we thank him for having the law? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's one other purpose to God's law, and we describe it in this way. It's a guide. It shows you the right way. How many of you have ever been on a curvy road and you see those signs that kind of know that the sign that is going to curve to the left and then to the right and back to the left? That's to guide you in the right path. God's law is a guide. It points you in the way to live in a way that's pleasing to God. In the right way to be. So three purposes to the law. Here it's a guide. It shows God's will. How to live the right way. Get the outline that you're looking at. I need to add to your grid, get to that grid that we did, I need you, when you get to the right next to the law, to write the words SOS. That SOS, what does the law do? Shows our sin. Now I need you to put an SOS by the word gospel. What's the SOS by gospel? Remind us of. Shows our Close. It shows the solution. What's another name, a title we give to Jesus Christ? Shows our salvation. Not salvation. It shows our Savior. SOS. Savior. So add that to your grid here, SOS. This one shows our Savior. This one shows our Sin. So why don't you put shit sin there and save it so you got it. Did you add that to the grid? The SOSs? And make sure you remember what they remind you of. I need to give you a homework assignment. Can you do that for me? You know what? We are quickly running out of time. Can you turn into me your Genesis, the, the little worksheet you did in your small group? Make sure your name's on it. Sam, would you collect those for us? Thank you for asking. Say, I'm trying to learn a great good habit, 
would you be willing to help me and commit to doing this? You know, when we talked earlier, our strategy was to say, you know, sometimes a good habit is you need a, another way to, to develop a good habit is to have a partner who's trying to develop the same habit at the same time. And then you can say, how do you do it? Did you do it? Did you remember? I got mine. You got yours? Now that can be another very, very successful strategy. Uh, this center saint, I'd like you to work on that at home. It does some review. It does some of the same things we've been talking about. Uh, who learned some new things tonight? Or relearned some things you already knew? What I'd like you to do is to stop and reflect. What did I learn that I want to remember? And uh, to take ownership for your learning. We've got about 11 minutes. We're going to send you to your guide groups. I'm going to say go back to the same spot. I've got a green sheet for you to work on that I gave uh, put at your spot. And uh, what we can do is uh, spend a few minutes with that. Make sure you do time for highs and lows. Uh, add some time in prayer. I'm going to ask, uh, is there a student in your group who would volunteer to do your closing prayer in your group? <laughs> Sarah, you're going to do that. Ty, you're going to do it. Emma, you'll do it from there. Okay. We're going to send you a group. You need to be done in 11 minutes.